Empire. Hello and welcome to another live stream edition of the John Kahn Report. Do me a favor, subscribe to the show wherever you get your podcast. And if you're watching us later on YouTube, hit that like button, hit that subscribe button. And for those of you watching right now, if you haven't done that, please do me a favor and do that as well. Don't forget, you can also read my work on ESPN.com. I have a couple stories up now about, surprise, surprise, the big moves for Tuesday, of course, the trade of Montez Sweat and the trade of Chase Young. I'll have in a, a, some more story, another story out tomorrow. I'm sure there's going to be more from the locker room on Wednesday when we get back out and talk to the players about what they think about this move and, and what Ron Rivera thinks about these moves. And sometimes you wonder what they say publicly may not be what they're saying privately. So there you go. Anyways, before I get to your questions, and I want to make sure I get to as many questions of yours as I can. As you can see, I'm flying solo tonight. Bram opted to go trick-or-treating with his kids, and I don't blame him. Rough time finding a place for you and your roommate? Um. Just look for the mobile exclusive tag on thousands of hotels. Anyway, so I wanted to give you some of my quick thoughts about these moves today, the moves that were made and the moves that weren't made. And then you guys can ask me whatever you want. And I can answer as many as I can before I just conk out because it's been a long few days. So my first thought is I think they got good returns on these trades. And at one point, we all thought, I thought, and I was told that they wanted to extend Montez Sweat, that if Chase Young produced, that they would pay him the way they did Deron Payne the year before. But things changed, and the defensive line did not produce this way the way they had hoped. So what you do is you decide, are these guys a part of the future? Clearly, the answer was no. I do think that if they felt like they could get Montez Sweat at a certain price, I think they would have kept him. And I don't know what that price is, but I do think, or or that you know, I, I think that would have that would have been a more uh, possibility. I don't think with Chase Young that they were going to keep him after this year. I think there's some for I think there are you know one of the reasons why his value was only at at a third round was because teams had concerns about the durability of his knee and long term durability, and I think that's going to prevent him on the open market perhaps from getting the kind of deal that many would have expected from a player of his talent. So now you have five draft picks in the top 100 in April. You have three picks in the top 50. I think that's pretty good. Something that I've wanted them to do for a few years is to keep adding more picks and add some more picks in the top three rounds. So it gives you a chance to go be aggressive. Just like and I, the, the organization that I love talking about in this regard is the Eagles, because that's what they do. They load up on assets. And if they don't, if they don't get something in the draft, they have assets. They can go get a player when they need it in a trade. Kevin Byard, right? That's another example. You know, A.J. Brown, they went and got, right? So guys like that, they can go get because they have, they collect, they do a really good job of collecting assets. And that's here. And yes, it was, it's tough to give up two former first round picks, especially the second overall pick in the draft. But again, what has this group done? They haven't done anything and they've already invested in the defensive tackles. So perhaps if you hadn't already made the heavy investment in Deron Payne and John Allen, maybe you then go invest in the defensive ends, but they've already made that investment. So I think it, it behooved them and how there's a word, and I don't use that word very often, especially on the podcast, behooved them to look for a deal that could net them a good return for these players, get good value. I think, well, let's start with, with Montez Sweat, the value there. Listen, a high second round pick from the Bears is terrific. I wasn't, I knew they wouldn't get a first round pick for him. And I knew they would, certainly wouldn't get one for Chase because of the medical concerns. But for Young, you know, you started here the other, I think it was yesterday, told you that there was the, there was a third round offer with that could be a conditional two, depending if they could extend him. My strong belief was that was Atlanta. That's where he wanted to go. That's the one thing I kind of feel bad for him in this situation is he wanted to go to Atlanta. He's from there. He has family there. And I think after the tragedies he suffered a couple of years ago with his mom and his brother, I think it would have been, I think he would have loved, welcomed getting back with his, with his family. 
And so that's why in Chicago, man, you're going into from one bad position to another. And that's the thing I worry about for his sake is will how will that play out for him? But from a Washington perspective, this is a good move because you're getting a high second round pick for a guy that you were going to probably let leave in the off season or, or maybe, you know, so maybe you get a compensatory pick in 2025, no guarantee because for everybody listening, I think you know this, there's a formula. And if you let, like say if, if Chase Young or Montez Sweat had been here and then leave in the off season, let's say they trade one of them and the other one is here in the off season, but they leave in free agency. Well, if Washington goes out and signs another player to a comparable deal, there's no comp pick that washes it out. So they would have, they would have been out of luck in that situation. And that's why they wanted to make a move now, especially for sweat. So to get a second round, a high second round pick for him is really, really good. I knew that Chicago had, exp- I mean, multi- here's the other thing. Teams have been calling these guys for months about these players. So when you hear, when you hear things today, the, over the last week, like, Oh, they're open for business. They've been open for business, man. That's why they were, they were engaged in dialogue. Didn't mean they were going to necessarily trade them, but they've been listening for a long time. They knew what was out there. And it wasn't a matter of like, you know, oh, now they're going to turn their attention to trading Chase. This, these things were always on the table. I'm a little bit surprised that they traded both, but only a little bit surprised. And after a while, it became clear that they wanted to unload Chase Young. And you can take that however you want. And the fact that they only that they took a third for him, listen, I think they would have taken less had they gotten less. If they had, if their only offer was a lower pick, I think they would have taken that as well. So I think they just wanted to, they wanted to move on from him. And so they are. And I think, again, if you ask yourself, why is that? Well, you know, they wanted to move on. So I think for Chase, you know, he's a guy that he had five sacks. If, if, um, if they felt like there were, if they, let's say he had 10 sacks at this point, then you're not trading him because he's too good, but he doesn't. And, and, you know, so I think if you're going to, when you hear the whole do your job mantra, that was directed at the defensive line. And it wasn't just Chase Young, but certainly he was a guy that, that, that. With Anderson, their delivery dates are rock solid. I think it would be safe to say that they wanted him to do his job more often. So that's something that was a factor in this as well. But I also think a lot of it too was the long-term durability with the knee. And if you're not going to resign him, then you need to do something now. And that's what they did. So now they can build around their defensive tackles, Payne and Allen. And you also have, they listen, they have John Ridgway in there. I liked what he's done. They have Fedarian Mathis in there. I don't know what he's going to do because we haven't seen enough of him. But he's going to get, but that's where they're building around is that that's going to be the, the core is that defensive interior. And then you have James Smith Williams on the outside. You have Casey Tuhill on the outside, Effie Obata. Might we see a little bit of Andre Jones and or, and, or KJ Henry? You know, the last time we saw Andre Jones on the field, didn't go well for him. And we haven't seen him lately, but he's a young kid. And he's a guy that flashed in the summertime. So could he see a little bit more action? But keep in mind, and this is one thing, well, this, is, this is a quote, and I asked Ron Rivera about this on, on Monday about the defensive line. And, you know, he didn't want to talk about um, any personnel moves. So, the, but the question was, well, do you think the defensive line has played to the level he anticipated? And he said, not consistently enough. And again, you see it, but you've got to see it all the time. And that's really the mark of when it really comes together is that it's consistent. That's the end. Of, and in other words, the, you didn't see the consistency and they've been waiting for it since 2020. They knew they weren't going to see it again. So that's why they went out and made these moves and to go in a different direction. Now, when you look at this team for the future, and I know for you guys, man, it's always been about the future. And so I get it, but the future looks a little bit better, not because they got rid of talented players, but because of how you can now build. And I think when you start talking about roster building and this, you know, I know that could drive some of you nuts, you know, but it's not just about what Ron Rivera says or anybody else. But when you look at how our roster is constructed, do you want to invest all in one area or spread that around? And I think now you have a little bit more ability to spread around. You have $90 million in cap space. You have all these draft picks. You got to hit on the draft picks better than you've hit so far this year. No doubt. But you do have that capital. 
We also don't know who's going to be making these picks or making these football decisions in the future. Because if this group doesn't win, if they don't turn this around, then they're gone. I will say, and one thing I will say is that this, because I get asked a lot, like, well, why would Ron Revere want to do this? Doesn't this hurt him? First of all. Lindor, made to melt you by the Lint Master Chocolatier. Washington area kids' screen time is way up. I heard it on WTOP News, 103.5 FM. I don't think they feel like it does hurt them. So understand that. Number two, this actually helps them because they corroborated with, with Josh Harris. Of course, listen, any owner is going to be involved in any decision. So if you see Josh Harris was involved, of course he was. Of course he was, people. He's the owner. He paid $6 billion. But what it did, it gave him a chance to see how does this group operate? Are they making sound football decisions? And while Josh Harris hasn't spent time in the NFL, he knows sports leadership. He knows what a good deal is. He knows how to ask the right questions to determine what are they getting the value? Are they getting, you know, um, uh, you know, are, are they, are they again, getting good value? And I think in this case, it gave them, it gave Harris a, an up close chance to see their decision-making. And I think that helped him. <clears throat> so they, and they went to him with multiple trade offers, right? It wasn't just these two guys. There were multiple trade offers and they would go through it and explain, this is the, this is why this trade makes sense, or this is why this is not good value, et cetera. And Harris would say, okay, then don't do it. Or okay, let's make it. That's, that was his involvement, but there is, but so my point is he knows how this thing operated. So if you're Rivera and, and your staff and you now go win, let's say, let's say they catch magic in a bottle or is it lightning in a bottle, whatever it is, they, they get hot and they, they get to nine and eight and Sam Howell looks really good. And then Harris is going to look back on how this whole situation unfolded and maybe liked what he saw. So from, for this particular staff, that's a way. So saving their job didn't mean keeping these guys, saving their jobs meant you know, to save their jobs, it could mean that you have to make the right football decisions for the franchise, and then you have to go win. They still have to go win. They still have to prove it on the field. They still have to show that Sam Howell's a guy. But it does, I think, so for people wondering, you know, why they would do this, this actually helps them more than if they had held on to these guys and not told, either not given Harris all of all the um, information and and et cetera that, that I think um, – I think that he would have wanted. So I think that would have been a problem for them. And at the end of the year, it would have been like, well, you're gone because I didn't like the way you guys handled this. I think he liked, my understanding is he liked the way they handled this. So that bodes well for them if they go out and win. And I don't even, it doesn't mean that they're all back. I just think it means like, cause there's still, there still could be changes. I mean, definitely. I mean, the way Harris has always operated, he's always put a GM in place, then the coach. So there could still be changes regardless. And there could be wholesale changes. But for this staff to keep their job, I think they had to show them they could make a smart football decision. Now, go win. Don't miss The Marvels in theaters on November 10th and see where the Marvel stories all began when you watch Captain Marvel, WandaVision, and Miss Marvel only on Disney+. Plus. Get Disney Plus with Disney, Pixar, Marvel, Star Wars, and National Geographic. Plan starting at $7.99. You know, Eugene Shen, who was just hired as a senior VP of football strategy, basically the analytical position, he too was involved in the decision. When you look at the analytics of a situation like this, there's no way it's going to tell you to invest so heavily in one spot. So now, again, 90 million in cap space. You can go invest more and better in the offensive line. Keyword, better. Invest in the offensive line. You have these picks to where if you, depending on what you do in free agency, you know, you may you may be able to be aggressive and go up and get somebody. If Sam Howell doesn't show that he can be the long-term co- quarterback, well, now you have more ammunition to move up and possibly get one of the guys in this draft. So it just gives you more options. And I think that's a good thing. And like, listen, you hate to see good talent leave the door. Like I'm an Ohio State guy. I watched Chase Young in college. I see I've seen what he can do. He's the number two pick. I mean, you know, I think I I'd be curious to see where he went without that injury and what would have happened. Just like with Robert, you know, the injury has an impact. And all the other stuff you hear, I think it goes back to the injury. So, you know, what would it have been like? And it's a shame because the guy is, was dominant in college. So now let's see where his career goes. I mean, maybe he's going to San Francisco where, first of all, he's going to play for a good team 
and opposite Nick Bosa, I mean, that's a good thing for him. And, and he'll be back here on December for 31st. So, you know, exactly what's going to happen in that game anyway. So, but I think, you know, so it's, it could be a good thing for him and do they, you know, the, the other question is, do, are they better away from here? Were they getting the good enough coaching in this organization that could maximize what they do? And I think that, you know, that's a fair question to ask because listen, what, what have they produced here to show that they, that everything should be trusted? They haven't. Right. And this is not like when Joe Gibbs was here where it's like, well, it's Joe Gibbs. So, or, well, it's, you know, it's Richie Pettibone. You know, I trust the guy. I don't think any of these guys have earned that trust here. So that that's why I say like, you know, if it doesn't, if those guys go out and prove something somewhere else and Chase Young goes on to have this great long career, well, they botched it. <laughs> so that's as simple as that. And it could be that they're better away from here, but this group together, in some ways, my, my analogy had been, they're a little bit like uh, a basketball team that had like four 20 point scores and they all can do this, but they all do that, right? They all want to go get the quarterback. They all want to go do it. And sometimes you need the guys who just have to go get the rebound, who get, who do this, who do that, the little things, right. Or just, you know, just like, Hey, my job here is to rebound, just go rebound. Right. So those things add up and those that helps you, they need to make it work in this situation. And I'm going to give you a couple of numbers. I'm going to open it up for questions in a, in a minute too, but I want to give you some numbers if I can find them about what it was like when, so a couple of years ago, if you remember Chase Young and Montez Sweat both missed time. The defense actually improved during their absence. Now, I'm not going to put it all on the fact, well, Chase and Montez are out, so that's why they got better. I can't. I don't think you can go there because I don't think that's fair to them. I don't think that Chase was having his best year, and I think Montez, I think both were better this year, and I think they have way bigger problems this year than just, hey, do those two ends, do the, does a group have chemistry up front or not, right? Clearly, they have more problems than that. The secondary gives up way too many big plays. The linebackers have to be better. And I, you know, I know I'm going to have Bram on again soon. I think he'll probably say the same thing. They've got to do a better job filling the linebacker spots and getting guys in here um, where you can help in the back seven, more help than what they've gotten. Anyway, but I thought it was interesting that two years ago, they they went in the in 11 games with Sweat and, sweat and or Young on the field. They allowed 400, point, 400 points, 400 yards per game, um, 29.9 points, 56.2 conversion on third downs. In the six games without either one of those on the field, it was 284 yards, 32.9 on third down. Home isn't where we've been. It's where we're going. And um, 17.5 points per game. Now, those quarterbacks they faced then, it was Russell Wilson, Dak Prescott, um, Carr, and then um, Jalen Hurts. So, you know, that, so it wasn't like they were just facing stiffs that year. And again, I'm not going to write it all off to, oh, those two ends were out and these guys in. But the point is they played well with Smith Williams and two Hill at end. Not so much that it was because those guys were out, but because I think how they approached it when those two were in, I felt like they were a little bit more creative with their third down blitzes. I felt like that resulted in some more pressure because two, and I remember talking to people at the time too often that year, you'd hear like, you know, after the fact, it was like, Maybe they were relying too much on that front four to apply the pressure and this forced them to be a little bit more creative to find ways to apply that, pre- to find more ways to apply that pressure. One of the things I like about two Hill is he can drop too. He's a good athlete. And I think people finally have seen that this year, but he's a good athlete. And so he can play in space. So it gives you some options. If you want to do some overload blitzes and do things like that, that you can do that with him because he's comfortable in that role. And I think Smith Williams has been a solid fill in, for them, I feel Bada has been solid for them when he last year he was. So anyway, all is not lost there. I just you know, and I think there's always a gamble when you give up this kind of talent. There were no guys you'd want walking off the bus first more than Montez Sweat and Chase Young, and you know I. But I do think that I think you know certainly after they traded Montez, I think they made the right next move for for this organization for everybody there, and I think for what they want to do in the future. Um, the last thing is they did have some offers for Jacoby Brissett. A lot of people ask about that. And, you know, so the thing I would say there is, and I've said this a number of times, I know what they think they want. They want this guy to help mentor Sam, Sam Howell. It's not just about that though. Cause what if, if you're a coach, like fans can say whatever they want, media can say whatever they want, but in their minds, like if you go out and win the next two games, you're five and five, then what happens if Sam Howell gets hurt? Well, you have, now you have, um, you have Jacoby Brissett to come in 
and you can still be competitive. Why give that up? And what they were getting offered is like, a, my, what I heard at one point was a six round pick. That's not enough, man. For what, you know, you're getting a future guy who may or may, who is like a 25% chance to make the roster for a backup quarterback. No, that doesn't make sense at all. And then for other guys, like there wasn't value for Antonio Gibson, Curtis Samuel, there wasn't the value. Cam Curl, they want to keep. So, you know, that's why he's here. Anyway, so I wanted to explain that. And, um, you know, we'll, 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 uh, we'll, you know, we'll discuss it. There's going to be a lot more to, um, to, to discuss going forward. Anyways, let's get to some questions. Joshua wants to know, are you surprised they didn't make any moves to improve the old line? The Ezra Cleveland deal comes to mind. No, I'm not surprised just because I know they wanted to unload, unload players, you know, unload these two guys in particular. So, and I, I don't think they want to necessarily give up the future assets right now for that. Um, I think, you know, could it, would it have helped? Sure. But I'm not surprised that I don't think, I didn't feel like they were going into this, into this deadline looking to add players as much as they wanted to add assets for the future. So I, that's, you know, now, yes, I, your, your point is offensive line needs help. I agree with that. Um, I think that, you know, I think that's going to be an off season thing. I'm also curious to see how, what happens with like, where does Chris Paul go with it? Um, what does, how does it look with Tyler Larson? Those guys looked pretty good the other day, but I also think, you know, for Chris Paul, how is he, you, you face one style of defense in the Eagles. And I think his strength matched up with what they do, which is he, it allows him to kind of play in that phone booth area when he has to get out and move. What is he like out there? And I think we're, the jury remains to be, I think the jury is out on that one. Um, just because we need to see more in, in that. Um, so, and this goes back to the game the other day, Steve Moody has a lead given any explanation for changing the call on the field on Dotson's catch. Yeah. They just said that New York told them that, 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 it, that it was incomplete and, but it was, they said it was more of a suggestion more than it was a ruling, which is why they didn't tell Rivera that, um, you know, not to challenge it, but at that point it was fourth down. And, you know, I think, um, that's what it is. So Dave Rob says, I don't get time to, um, I'm not sure what he's saying. Seventh rounders have always played better than these two guys. Montez never played se full season. Now they're young, good rins. I, I don't, they're not bust because if you're a bust, you don't become rookie of the year. A bust to me is a guy who never gets it on the field. Like, you know, they had a guy a long time ago named Andre Johnson as a first round offensive tackle. He was as big a bust as I've seen here because he never played. He had no fire either. So I don't think that's, I would not call those guys a bust because I mean, they're productive players and they're going to have Montez Sweat's going to be in the league for a while. He's not a bust. America's most watched newscast, ABC's World News Tonight with David Muir is now available on YouTube. <clears throat> Robert Pear says, do you think the moves were made out of necessity and or to make a statement? I, th I think it was because of analyzing the situation. I think if, first of all, if, if Chase Young has 10 sacks, they're not trading them, you know? So the statement is this group hasn't produced. And I think they also, I think the statement also is again, do your job because, and that's what they want. So if you're going to preach that message, you got to back it up with, you know, if guys aren't, if you guys aren't doing that to your satisfaction, whatever anybody else on the outside, me or anybody else thinks, then, um, then you're going to, then you, you've got, if you're going to preach that message, You've got to back it up with adhering to it if guys aren't, if you feel, if you feel guys aren't doing it. And that, again, this is what I'm hearing um, more than anything. So just understand that. And this is right. Two, um, Blaine points out, Two Hill has one less sack than Chase at 20% of the snaps. He does. Now, Chase is a better overall player. Let's not get that, let's not get that twisted. Chase is a better player. However, Two Hill has been productive this year. And I think, you know, now, I think he can help them because he has in the past. And I, I don't think that this is going to be a situation where they're like, Oh my gosh, this guy can't play. We know they can play. And I think that, um, you know, let's see. Um, well, I'll get to this one because it deals with the 49ers. Connor, hope you're doing well this Halloween while I'm in here talking to you guys, I'm not getting any candy. So what do you think that's, that's how I'm doing. Heard speculation that Harris and the ownership group are heavily looking at the Niners for G GM candidates. I think it's too early to go down that road. I do think what well, the reason I even want to bring it up because I'm not, you know, I'm not getting into the whole speculation about who they're looking at, where they're looking at it. Listen, they're going to look everywhere 
for, for GM candidates, right? And I think the other thing to keep in mind, one thing I do know is that um, the way he likes to set up his organizations is, again, GM, then hire the coach because that's how – that's how – that's what it's, it's what he believes in. And I, I remember writing that when he first, when he first bought the team or they had first had the offer, like this is how he likes to set it up. And I think that if you, um, if you um, listen, that's what he believes in. It's what he did for the other organization. So I don't know that the structure will be the same at the end of the year. I think it's too early for me to say that because again, what if they, what if he feels this is working? What if they do something and they go on some run again, whether we think they can or not, Let's say they do, then that's that's what you get. But what if what if they what if he deems you know what I like the way the coaching staff handled this situation, or I like the way the team responded to this adversity, or that whatever. Like I like the way the team responded. So then maybe you say, well, I want to keep the coach or the, a lot of the staff, but maybe you want a GM. I don't know. I think it's a little bit easy, a little bit early for that. But I do know how um, how they operate. So again, I've kind of gone over this, but Justin wants to know why trade chase for a third round pick. If we get a third round comp pick to let him walk after the season anyways, well, there's two reasons. And that's a, it's a good question. And I hope I've answered it, but I'm going to answer it again because I think people still continue to, to have questions about that. So the reason is it's not a guarantee. They get a third round comp pick. There's a formula. And the formula is if you sign, if you lose a guy at that level and you sign a guy at that level, you're not getting a comp pick. So let's say they have $90 million to in, in salary cap space. They're not going to spend it all. They're going to spend a lot. So if you sign one big-time free agent and you lose Chase Young as a big-time free agent, it washes out. There's no comp pick. So that's not a guarantee. And if you think – so this is a very – one thing I know at the Harris Group, they're a very logic-based organization. I think it's why, for you guys, I'm optimistic about what they can do because – I covered a non-logical based owner for 24 years. Everything was, you know, I, I've written this, but it was always uh, fire, aim, ready. This group is ready, aim, fire. So when you look at the situation, you can analyze it like, okay, there's this much in cap space. Are you going to spend on a couple of big players? Probably. You can't say you're not because you have the cap room to do it for the first time in a while. So chances are you're going to spend some of that money. Are you going to lose Chase Young? Do you want to keep him? Maybe not, because you have concerns about the long-term viability of, of the knee. Therefore, probably going to go in for agency. So if, you, if you're going to sign a guy, if you think you're going to sign a big-name guy, regardless of who it is right now, we don't know now who it is, but and let's say if there's a new coach and he wants to go get player X, they'll go get player X because that's what Josh Harris does. So if you do that, then and then Chase Young leaves or Montez Sweat leaves, you're not getting the comp pick. And I think why, you know, why not wait? Well, because I think they, again, do your job. That's like, that's all I can say is, you know, you know, just, you can read between the lines of all this when, if they're trading them like that, there's a reason, there's always a reason. And, you know, and again, I, I do think though, a big part of it is, had he been more productive than you, I don't think you do trade because you're being highly productive. And, and while his pass rush has been, but listen, Chase Young has been rushing better this year. He's rushing more effectively, less stutter stepping. <clears throat> but, you know, I think there were, you know, some of the plays that always get to them is losing outside contain. There was a play the other day. Let me make, I'll make this clear too. He wasn't the only one freelancing on that group. That's the, the, this, that mantra, the do your job was directed at the D line. But I think that was, you know, he certainly was viewed through that prism by, by, you know, based on people I've talked to. And so I'm always just, the messenger for this information um, because I'm not sitting in on meetings. I'm not, I'm not, you know, I'm not a, a, an expert on what they're supposed to be doing, but you do see stuff and, and, and you do hear stuff. And that's why I relay it to you anyway. So that's why you do. So that's why if you keep him for the rest of the year without the intent of signing him, you're probably not going to get that comp pick based on the fact that they have all that salary cap money available. I hope that makes sense. And I think it's, like I said, it's a good question because I think that's, one of the things that's hard with the salary cap is uh, is, is that um, uh, is, is is understanding that there's a formula for that. The you know the other thing too again if Sam Howell does not hit if they don't feel if they don't feel um, that he's the quarterback this gives you the ammunition to move up and that's what the good teams do and so if I were them like 
I'm a big proponent of adding draft capital just for situations to you, not always to draft guys, but it's to use as assets to get the right guys at the right time. You know, I look at the chiefs, the way they built their roster, then they went and bent they were aggressive for, um, for getting, for getting Patrick Mahomes, but they had the roster around them. The Eagles had the roster around Jalen hurts. That's why he's so good. Or that's why that offense is so good. Cause I don't think like, Jalen hurts this year is like, sometimes he looks really good. And other times it's like AJ Brown's a freaking beast. You know, do you, if you watch <laughs> watch him the other day, like he's a different dude. That is, he is like the fact that he's in the MVP consideration or, or, or just discussion is tremendous for a receiver, but he was dominant the other day. And, and, you know, he is, he's the best receiver in that division. I don't, I mean, clear. Right. So I, I, but that's what they have. They surrounded him with all this talent and that's what this team needs to start doing. The question is, can this group, if they're, st- if they stick around, can they do it? I don't, there's a long way to go before we can say they're sticking around. So um, I think that's something that um, will be one to watch. And the, and the other part is too, and I brought up those numbers from a couple of years ago, but this defense has holes in the secondary. And I will say, going back to the AJ Brown, there were times that coverage was pretty damn good. Like Benjamin St. Juice said a couple of times where the coverage like, I don't know that you're going to play it better. And even on the Forbes one, he played it pretty well up until the end, which is part of the equation. And I know from the team's perspective, they felt like Brown reached out and pushed him enough and impacted him enough for him not to be able to recover in time. He was in position. It wasn't, he wasn't just beat. He, he lost at the, at the, at the, at the ball. Right. But it wasn't a beat because he fell, fell hard for a double move or anything like that. AJ Brown made a great play, but again, in their eyes, it was a push off. Then, then Benjamin St. Juiced, on the one touchdown, it was a tremendous play, catch by A.J. Brown, a one-handed catch. St. Juice is in a pretty good spot. So, you know, but this, but in, but then there's a busted play that leads to a touchdown for Devontae Smith. You know, like there's things like that that always happen with this group, and that has to change. Like, I, I think you need to get more production out of guys like Percy Butler. You know, um, that you have to. And you need product. Shoot, you need production from Quan Martin and Emmanuel Forbes. I mean, Forbes has to be better. He has to make some plays. He hasn't made a play. You know, he hasn't made a play. And so, like, until that changes, all these moves, you know, like they can feel like, oh, is there? Is, do they get a jolt because you have a different mindset now or better on-field chemistry? Maybe, but the back seven needs to do its job too. And you know, I think I know there's a lot of belly aching about Cody Barton for much of the year. The guy was playing better. You know, the film showed it. He was playing better against Atlanta. He was really good. And, you know, so and even against the Giants, there, you know, he was playing better. The other thing he did is he had the green dot. He was responsible for all the signals and all that. It took that pressure off Jamin Davis. Now, they gave Jamin Davis the green dot the other day, but there were times where it's just like, I don't feel like he was playing a spot. And I haven't rewatched all the defense, but a couple times in pass, in, in pass coverage, you know, I felt like, you know, you got to play that better. And is it because you're putting more on his plate? Maybe that's where Cody Barton helped. And they don't have a guy like him. And you know, the other thing, like, the, the, again, the belly aching about Barton, I understand. Like, he did not start well. The other thing is he's a low – He, if you have a problem with it, it's with the organization, not with Cody Barton, because the organization decided to give bring him in at a small contract and not retain Cole Holcomb and not pursue someone else. And so, like, they have to do a better job there. If Barton is a backup for you, you're in good shape. And I think even as a starter, he was doing better. And I think that's the one thing. And, and I felt like he was starting to play a little bit more instinctive. And it was a new defense for him. So I'm not trying to make excuses for him. My point is, I think that it had a trickle down on, on, on Davis. But the back seven has to play better. And they need to get some production out of guys. Again, Forbes has simply got to help him in the second half of the year. And that's making some plays. And, and, and that hasn't happened. Why didn't Washington ask the Niners for the same deal that Atlanta wanted for Sweat with Young signed with San Fran after season third round pick for turning second? Pretty simple, because nobody else is willing to go there. I, I think this was by far the best deal they had. I, I think if this hadn't happened, I think you may have been surprised at what would have happened. And so that's why the, the you have to have leverage. Um, if you have a couple teams, like if Atlanta wants to give them a conditional two, and the Bears say, okay, that's what it takes, we'll give you a two. That's how you get the better deal. But when other teams are concerned about the medicals, 
you don't have the leverage to ask for something more than that. It happens that the Niners had multiple third round picks. So it led to a better, better return for, for Washington because of that. So, you know, I think, I think that is um, just something to keep in mind. That's why and it's always about leverage. And I know like people bring up Leonard Williams and this, that like Leonard Williams signed an extension. So if you have a guy a couple of years ago, um, Bradley Chubb, who is not as good as these guys signed an extension before the move. And so that helped him. And plus, they, you know, there was some leverage there with Chase. There was just no leverage because of the medicals. It was, I heard that multiple times from various people about that was the concern for teams. And so I think, um, you know, I think that's, that was, that's the reason why they did there. So Todd wants to know with both of them gone, could you possibly see the commanders going on winning streak or is the season practically over? Listen, I thought the season was over a couple times the last few years and then they went on a winning streak. I think it's just different this year, and I don't know how to read it just yet. So part of the problem is the defense is, again, it, the line was inconsistent, but the back seven was really inconsistent, and they have to be a lot better. If Sam Howell and the offense can play the way they did on Sunday, they'll win more than – they'll win – a few more, certainly several more games, but they have to play that way. And they need to keep that kid upright because as much as he feels he can take the hits, it's hard to absorb that kind of pounding and feel good late in the year. So this is, and I was talking to someone today who once coached Andrew Luck, Jameis Winston, his point was, you've got to, you know, this is you know, this is a marathon. Like you can't, it's not about get, picking up that third and 10. It's about keeping your body strong for 17 games. So but could they go out of streak? So it starts with how the offense doing that defense playing better. I, I wonder, you know, when, when John Allen comes out and says what he did a week or so ago, or after, after the giants game, that was telling because that was a, the summation of several years, not just this season. So can they do it? I think, I do think they will be in a good mind, mind frame coming off of all of this. And I think a big key to me about the winning streak is what happens when you go up to New England? Do you play well? If you do, if you win and you have to win, but do you play well and win? That can give you a little bit of a kickstart because it doesn't always take a, this massive like turnaround, but the defense has to play a lot better, man. It just, they just have to. Cause if they're, you can't, they're bottom four in, in, in the two biggest categories, that's unacceptable. So if you don't play better than that, you're going to go nowhere anyways. I don't care what Sam Howell does. And then it becomes about developing Sam Howell. And I think that's such a big part of the rest of the season because I know from talking to, to Rivera and I wrote a story about this in, in September where he talked about, you know, if he leaves his franchise and what he feels is a good place, that's enough for him. In other words, you maybe you get to 8-8-1 eight, eight, and one again and you have your quarterback in Sam Howell and you have a good young roster that's enough for him. And so I think today was another reminder of that sort of belief that whatever happens, that if you set this franchise up for the future, he will have felt that maybe he he did what he came here to do, which is to help turn around. What he had to guide this thing through for three years was unbelievable while having cancer. And I don't think people realize that cancer affected him for a long time, much longer than people I think realize in terms of what it took out of him. So that was a massive chore to guide through that. And then if you can get through this season, if you can get it to a certain point, and then you have these future assets and you have a quarterback that you can build around for a few years, then you've put this place in this franchise in a better place than you found it. So now it would have taken four years. I get it. But, but, you know, this is the first time where it's been a normal, I think year for them as far as ownership, et cetera, and no investigations, no crazy nonsense. It's just been football decisions. And so can they, so that's a long, that's a long winning answer, Todd, to say, I don't know if they're going to go on a winning streak, but I'm, but I also know like with a lot of the players that they are tired of the losing, they're definitely tired of it. And when you, when you haven't won in a while, it's natural. If you, if you work at a company that's not succeeding, don't you question your bosses? Well, of course, of course you do, whether it's position coaches or anybody, or the guys in charge, whatever. Of course you do. But if you, but I will say like this, and you know, players, I think it was Terry McLaurin was saying the other day about how this is a tight knit group. And, and, you know, and so I think 
Like, I think that bond will help them. And usually when teams do well, it's because you're playing for the guy next to you. And do they get that? I don't know. I've been around teams, a lot of teams where you say like, I think this team is better than that. And I thought this team was better than this, but I thought they'd be better than this with a healthy Chase Young and Montez Sweat on the roster. Now I don't know. And I do, I, I know James with Williams can play and I know Casey Tuhill can play. So I think they can help them. I don't think all is lost there. I just have concerns about other spots. You know, will the offensive line do enough to, to, to help them produce, you know? So I, I, you know, I don't know. And will the, will the back seven be more consistent? I don't know. They have to be, if they do, then yes, they can go on a streak. Can they, you know, and, and the playoffs aren't, aren't dead yet. I mean, you know, Minnesota just lost Kirk Cousins and Cousins was having a really good year. So that, you know, that hurts a playoff contender. They can sneak in for that spot if they turn around. It has to start Sunday, man. You can't can't keep putting this winning. You can't keep putting this off and keep saying, well, you know, if you lose Sunday, well, there's still eight games left. Yeah, but you keep losing them. So that doesn't help. So they got to start Sunday and win. And if they do, then sometimes things can change like that because I've seen that before and I think we've all seen it before, but you have to play well and you can't lay eggs against bad teams in New York. That's what you can't do. Oh, um, yeah. Anyways, let's see. I don't know. If there's much, much more to add. I think you know. There's, there's, um, there's just, there's, there's only one way to go from here, and that's start looking down the road. But I do think that you know a lot of this so much hinges on Sam Howell, and and I'm sure you guys do too, and. I don't know, folks. I think that's about all I have to say. If if you guys, um, I'm going to put this one up if about because Todd brought this up if Brock, about Brock Bowers. So just looking ahead, like yes, I would agree. He's talking about if Brock Bowers comes out, um, should they draft him? It's too early. First of all, to say because we don't know where they're drafting. If they're drafting the top ten, they need an offensive. They're going to need an offensive tackle, you know. And I think you start there. I do think tight end will be a spot you have to look at next year. And I felt like this year. It was not a spot because you knew that Logan Thomas was coming back. I think had they drafted one, then you kind of signaled that Logan Thomas is done. That's and if they had gone that way. Thomas can still help them, but they haven't gotten the production from Cole Turner, and and they haven't, you know. And John Bates is a good blocker and he can catch the occasional pass, but I think they needed another guy there who could be dynamic. I thought Armani Rogers could have been that guy. I think that injury really hurt them, and I know it was only you know he was a new tight end. But I felt like that really hurt them. And I think like that's a spot though that I would look at for next year with the, you know, regardless of who's back, I think that's going to be a spot that you look at. So anyway, folks, that's it for me. I um I got nothing else to say, man. I got nothing else to say. So if you guys, if you guys have anything more, that's great. I appreciate you tuning in. I'll be back on Thursday with another episode of the podcast. I'll be back on Friday slash Saturday with, I'm going to be talking to Mike Reese who covers the Patriots. What's it been like for Bill Belichick and what's going on up in New England, but I'll have my keys and predictions for the game as well. So tune in and I appreciate you tuning in. And this is a clumsy ending. So I'm just going to say goodbye. Talk to you next time.